Biostatistics is one of the most rewarding careers in the health field, but it's not really something most people know about. Hi, my name is Christian and welcome to Very Normal, a channel where I talk about biostatistics and my life as a PhD student. One of the reasons I made this channel was to create a more centralized resource for people to learn more about biostatistics. When I was still trying to figure out what biostatistics was, I remember that the only resource I used was Wikipedia. There weren't that many interesting or useful resources on YouTube, and I thought that this was a gap that I could fill. I don't just do outreach through YouTube. I'm also the chair for the outreach committee in my department, and one of my jobs is to go to different schools and spread the word about biostatistics to math, statistics, and data science undergrads. I get a lot of questions from students, and often the same questions come up again and again. So I'm dedicating a new series talking about these questions and have them on YouTube. This is Office Hours. For this video, I'll focus specifically on getting into a master's program. I think that a master's program is what most people consider when they first think about getting into biostatistics. Since most of the time, they don't realize it's a thing until after they graduate. I'm in the unique position of having experienced two master's degrees in my life. One for the actual master's degree that I went through, and another as a PhD student, where I had to share classes with different master's students. If you're thinking about applying to a biostatistics program, it's a good idea to know what you're getting into. It can be really confusing to look through course descriptions and class titles and not really know what you're getting into. This is especially true if you don't have a statistical background like me. It's very common for people to come to biostatistics through an adjacent field like biological sciences or chemistry. For myself, I actually had a biomedical engineering degree before I got into biostatistics. Before my master's program, I had only taken a total of two statistics classes as an undergraduate. I'll divide this video into sections, each section being dedicated to a semester of my master's program. For each semester, I'll talk about the classes that I took and the specific skills that I learned in each class. I'll be honest, first semester was really tough for me. I had been out of school for about three years, and I'd forgotten really how to study and really be in class and get used to homework and a daily schedule like that. I took four courses in my first semester. Students need to take probability because statistics is so reliant on it. You literally can't understand statistics if you don't understand the main concepts from probability. Some of the central concepts you need are things like random variable, conditional probability, central limit theorem, and asymptotic. And that's not even close to naming all of them. This was my hardest class this quarter because it was the most mathiest. I had taken the hardest math classes as an engineering major, but none of these really required the same amount of technical proofs that this class needed. I wasn't used to these at all, so most weeks I always found myself in office hours trying to get help from the TA. Despite its name, this class wasn't a data science class. It was a programming class. This entire class was dedicated to getting students up to speed with the R programming language. I didn't know this at the time, but statistics is done more with a keyboard and a computer rather than a pen and paper. So if you want to practice biostatistics, you need to be really comfortable with the statistical programming language. I will say that you can learn a general purpose language like Python, but learning a language specifically tailored to statistics is going to be more useful and just save you a lot of time in the long run. I would say this is the most important class to really get good at if you're trying to pursue a master's in biostatistics. Like I said, if you can't code it, you can't do statistics. This class was the first in a two-part series that started to introduce statistics from a more biostatistical lens. That is, all of your examples come from stuff like clinical trials and things involving human subjects. The first half of this class dealt with stuff like the t-test or the z-test, stuff that you might see in an undergraduate class. The second half of this class was dedicated more to linear regression. And this is where I really learned that linear regression is much more powerful than I really thought. And that's why it takes almost an entire semester to teach students the topic. This class wasn't really that hard, but because you're dealing with linear regression, you start to deal with other fields like linear algebra because it just cleans up the notation. If you're not used to the linear algebra, then linear regression can be a little bit confusing to uh, interact with. 
Epidemiology is kind of like a sister discipline to biostatistics, whereas biostatistics is really just about the application of statistics to medical or biological contexts. Epidemiology is more so focused on disease, where a disease comes from, how it's spread, and what causes it. Master's programs are supposed to be really short, only taking about two years. You're going to be learning a lot your first year because all of these concepts you learn in your classes are going not only to be used in your research and your projects, but also in the more advanced classes in your second year. So these are the classes I took in my second semester. Data Science 2 was a class on machine learning. I know there are a lot of memes out there that say that machine learning is just a cover for statistics, but this class really highlights the different goals that you might want from machine learning rather than inferential statistics or descriptive statistics. I can explain it like this. Here's a linear regression model. In an inference setting, we're interested in knowing the value of these coefficients and whether or not they include a certain value, like zero. In machine learning context, you want this model for prediction. You don't really care about the coefficients at all. You just wanna make sure that your model can produce good predictions on data that it hasn't seen before. I've definitely heard a lot of master students kind of confuse machine learning and statistics together. On a side note, I kind of felt like this class was a little bit unnecessary because the teacher totally taught out of a textbook. And the textbook we used was the famous ISLR book, which you can find for free online. If you want to take this class, just find the textbook and do the exercises. Statistical inference is a class about mathematical statistics. And that's the legitimate name of the field. Like, you can Google it. This is where you learn about core concepts and raw statistics instead of just biostatistics. You learn about theoretical stuff like the properties of estimators and the maximum likelihood estimator. Most likely, you'll also learn a little bit about the theoretical pinning behind hypothesis tests, which is much harder than I really anticipated. I think it's fair to say that most of the concepts that appear in this class don't really come up in a research context, unless you're maybe like a theoretical student. But for my area of research, not really. Like I mentioned before, Biostat 2 is the sequel to Biostat 1. Whereas Biostat 1 ended with linear regression, Biostat 2 picks up at that place by starting to look at things like logistic regression, Poisson regression, other generalized linear models. The second half of this class dealt with little taste tests of harder statistical topics like longitudinal modeling and survival analysis. These topics are a lot harder for master's students, so that's why this class kind of gave people a sense of what they could expect with notation and statistical ideas. I learned a lot in this class because this class was really good and the professor was a good lecturer, but there's like one scary element about it. My professor had a little show he called Biostats Got Talent, and it was a punishment where if he asked the question in class and nobody wanted to answer it, he would cold call you. If he cold called you and you got the answer wrong, he would make you perform a talent show in front of the whole class in the next lecture. This was my hardest class this semester. And you can tell because the class had the word advanced in it. So this class comes up because computation actually has a big role in statistics. Not everything in statistics has an analytic form or like a formula. And often you need computers or optimization algorithms to estimate the coefficients in certain models. We covered stuff like random number generation, the newton raphson algorithm, the EM algorithm, and even got a little taste of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And this was the class where I learned that very smart people exist in the world. One day where we, we were assigned a first project, our professor gave us 30 minutes to talk and try to schedule when we were just going to meet up and even work on the project. But 20 minutes in, one of the PhD students actually finished the entire project and programmed all of it, just in the amount of time it took me to tell someone that I was free on Wednesdays and Fridays. But in retrospect, that's really where the power of being really comfortable with the statistical programming language comes in. They already knew the theory from being a PhD student, but they knew how to translate that into code because they just had really strong programming skills as well. At the end of the first year, students actually have all the skills they need to start helping on projects. They can't help on super advanced projects, but for most needs from people like doctors and researchers who just need help on an analysis, us master students can actually help out in those contexts. 
After your first year, you theoretically have a strong understanding of the fundamentals of biostatistics, so this is where you start to see some harder classes. Causal inference is a set of techniques where you try to turn observational data and try to extract cause and effect statements from it. This is in contrast to the experimental data that you might deal with in the beginning of your career as a master's student. For example, if we're interested in the effect of vaping and we don't know if vaping harms people, it's unethical to randomize one group of people to vaping and another not to vaping just to see if vaping hurts people. You just can't do that. You need observational trials for that. And I thought causal inference was really interesting. It got really technical with definitions and stuff, but it wasn't too big of a step up from the types of models that we learned previously. Despite the name of this class, this was actually a clinical trial class. It did have a side focus of analyzing data from a Bayesian perspective, but these analyses are always done in a clinical trial context. I think it's important to point out that as a master's student, it's almost guaranteed that all the statistics you learn come from the frequentist school of statistics rather than the Bayesian school. I can offer a little bit of a student perspective here. Frequentist analysis is really easy to do and work with as a student, but in order to do proper Bayesian statistics, a lot of the background knowledge you need to even start is a lot. There's a lot of overhead with this. It gave me some insight on how statistics is actually done in industry, like in pharmaceutical companies, very computation heavy and simulation based. Before this class, the only trial that I was really familiar with was the randomized controlled trial, which most people should know, but there are actually other designs out there that people use to learn stuff about the world. I talk a little bit about these extra designs in my pocket set series, which I recommend watching if you don't mind sticking around. My master's program made a weird choice here. They made us choose between longitudinal analysis and survival analysis. In retrospect, this doesn't really make a lot of sense because survival analysis is such a quintessential biostatistics skill. It doesn't make sense to have people graduate without this skill. In longitudinal modeling, you're able to start considering trials that measure data at different time points. And you might want to use this because you suspect that drug effects evolve over time or they may change, so you want to take that into account with your analyses. This is the class that most master students don't have to take, so I won't cover it much. It's like the statistical inference class I took last quarter, but it's designed for PhD students. I knew that I wanted to try at least once to apply to be a PhD student. I was really determined to prove that I could learn and keep up with the PhD students because I wanted to be just like them. In my last semester, I only took one class. It was a statistical consulting class. In this class, you actually go to meet with a researcher like a doctor or a postdoc who needs help with an analysis. And you meet with them while you partner up with a senior statistician like one of your professors. You listen in on the problem and then you try to provide advice on how they might approach the analysis. And then after you have this consulting session, you just give a presentation about it to the class. And then you're essentially done until you graduate. Sometimes I get a little sad when I think about this class because I was supposed to have a lot of fun in New York because I didn't really have much responsibilities. But then coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here's to wrap it all up, this is a general guide to the skills that you would learn from a master's program in biostatistics. In terms of theoretical foundations, most of it is just squeezed into your first year. But just because the initial knowledge is built in these classes, doesn't mean that you fully understand how to use them. And that's why the consulting class and starting to do research projects is really important because they're actually an application of your skills. My particular program had a consulting class, but other programs might have something akin to a project-based class where you just do work with the professor and try to get publication or proper statistical analysis in before you graduate. Essentially, a master's program gives you two years of practice using statistics with the statistical programming language. That is the key skill that you learn in these programs. And that's why I stress that learning the programming skill is so important. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about statistics, I made a video covering the 100 most important topics in statistics. I hope this was helpful. If you have any other burning questions, please feel free to leave it in the comments and ask me directly, and I'll try to make a video for you. Office Hours is done. I'll see you next time.